Hey, what's up, what's up, what's up, YouTube and all my podcast listeners? It's your boy, Agostino. Welcome to number episode number what? 72 of the Agostino Zinga Show. How can you forget a podcast name that's named after yourself, right? That's pretty weird, isn't it? Um, apart from the old stutter at the beginning and the old, um, what you think? Well, how, how would you call it? The uncertainty behind my podcast name. How the hell are you guys doing, man? How are you? Are you doing well? You all right? Uh, top of the fucking week to you. It's Monday. Monday, Monday, Monday. We're kicking things off nice and hot. Obviously, yes, last week, I think, not obviously. Well, last week, if you're paying attention, I missed an upload last week. So I'm going to try and cram in two or three this week to make up for my shortcomings last week. But Jesus Christ, man, what a packed week has been. And I hope your week has been packed um, in a good way. Not that kind of like, you know, that um, corny, oh, I'm so busy, I don't have enough time sort of way, but in like a cool, interesting way. Hope you've had one of those kind of weeks. And I've had, I've had one of those kind of weeks, to be honest. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of showed me uh, parts of my life that are probably not where they need to be. And it's also showed me parts of my life that I really, really want to upgrade and push a little bit further. Because if you can't level up in life, what's the effing point, right? What is the bloody point? Um, so, first things first, what have I been up to? This week, mostly I've been up to, I've got, just got back from Spain, actually. So uh, I went with a brunette to go visit her family in Spain, and it was amazing, absolutely amazing. We went to a city in Spain called Madrid, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. And if I'm completely honest, even though I'm about to go to um, Primavera in a couple of weeks, well, next week I'm going to Primavera Sound, which is a big electronic music festival that has, you know, tons of people playing, loads of bands, loads of hip-hop acts, loads of DJs spread across for three days is the main event but usually people go for four so we're going to fly in on thursday and we're going to come back by monday uh thursday the 31st and monday whatever that date is so i'm looking really looking forward to it and i've been to barcelona three or four times all right i enjoy it <clears throat> but if i'm 100 percent honest madrid's my city man madrid's my fucking city i much prefer madrid i guess the easiest conclusion you could make from it you could say like barcelona's probably a little bit more touristy than madrid um but that's probably a little bit more of an easier excuse i'd say Madrid just has more of an authentic feel. I just feel like I'm in Spain for real when I go to Madrid. And that may be in partly due to because, you know, the Catalan culture is, is very different from the Madrid culture or from the Spanish culture of Peru. There's this whole kind of um, turmoil going on in Spain with Barcelona trying to declare independence. The Barcelona, the Barcelona prime minister or president, whatever you call them, he, he uh, finally got arrested and brought back to, uh, to Spain to kind of face the consequences of him trying to uh, force Barcelona's independence. So there's this weird kind of pull that's happening and, you know, Bar people in Barcelona, the Catalans, believe that they account for most of the wealth that Spain generates overall, blah, 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 blah. So there's a weird tension and it's a very different culture. You know, they speak a different language. They speak Catalan, even though uh, a lot of people in, Sp in Barcelona do speak Spanish as well. So it's a very strange culture that goes on behind there. But I guess for me personally even though barcelona has a beach right it's, it's on a coach so they, they have a a kind of a beach it's not like you know it's not like a sandy beach you're gonna find in the dominican republic or whatever but it's a nice beach uh nice stuff than anything we have in, in england or london i still feel that for me that i prefer i'm I said for me a lot of times haven't i for me i'm turning, I'm turning into a valley girl don't know what's happened to me um i've been following a lot of these um youtube fitness and health girls uh the last couple of weeks for some reason i don't know why i've been fascinated watching their uploads and seeing how they treat their uh, content and how they what the things they talk about and for the most part you know what's funny right? this just i'm gonna go back to the madrid thing you know what's funny about these youtube um girls for the most part they're fairly lo-fi in their approach to um youtube content and to just social media content overall um, the YouTube videos are usually filmed on just an iPhone or a smartphone or like a really cheap camera. They seem to edit all their stuff on their phone on iMovie or like a really basic program like on Mac such as iMovie or maybe uh, Final Cut Pro. But I don't really see a lot of um, effects like what Casey does. They're quite lo-fi, but they consistently put up videos. So if, if, if anyone's out there and you're kind of, I don't know, you want to get into the whole vlogging thing, I re highly recommend you check out some of these big vloggers on, on YouTube. And just, you know, you can just type in stuff like flat tummy tea and stuff and you'll find loads of them talking about flat tummy tea. And then from there, kind of they take a deep dive into certain channels and you'll see that it's not as polished as you'd think it was. Like, I don't know, maybe I had a different idea behind it. But for the most part, especially the ones that are like under 25, they're quite lo-fi for the most part of it. So, yeah. Anyway, back to the whole Spain conversation. I really, I didn't have a good time in Barcelona the first couple of times I went there because 
I like an idiot. I incorrectly, you know, when you do a weekend trip and you do it, I, I requested three days off of work. This the time, the time that I went a few years ago, right? But the flight that I took out made me land really late. So I landed at about 10 30 p.m. I was staying in an Airbnb, and of course, if you're an Airbnb host and your guest is arriving at 10 30 p.m., it's super annoying, right? Because you want to go out and socialize with your friends. Plus, I think it was a Friday that I kind of flew in. So it took a while for me to get the keys from the host. And when I finally got the keys, I was feeling super tired, so I didn't even have time to go out. I slept until about 2 a.m., right? And then I woke up, tried to get out, tried to go out and have a good time. But, you know, like like any like any city that isn't Berlin, to go out in a metropolitan city after 2 a.m. is quite difficult to find somewhere to go, especially if you're not used to the area, right? Because for the most part, if someone, if I'm in London, I could definitely find a party to go to after 2 a.m. Like, I know where to go, right? But in other places in, uh, around Europe, unless you've got friends on the ground, it's hard to kind of find somewhere to go, that, especially if you go out, outside of the main peak hour. So I tried to find somewhere to go. I couldn't find anywhere. I think I stumbled into, like, a shitty, like, Irish bar or something. Ended up talking to the owners, having a bit of a lock in there. But by that time, you know, trying to get drunk between hours of 2 and 6 isn't a good idea. Then I had my half marathon on the Sunday anyway, so I had to take the Saturday easy. I ended up meeting some people from a meetup group, which is amazing. I definitely recommend you check that out. If you're traveling on your own, definitely recommend you check out meetup.com. It's an amazing website where people put together these um, sort, sort of social groups that you can go and meet um, expats or you can meet um, people that have moved to their area recently or whatever it may be or um, exchange students, whatever it may be. So at that time, I was heavily into learning Spanish, so I took this... Uh, meetup class that involved uh, a language exchange so there'll be people in Barcelona who are trying to learn English and obviously people su such as myself are trying to learn Spanish and we did this thing where we went on a bit of a bar crawl and the organizers have set up the deal with each bar where you we pay like really pennies for the for, for a drink because I'm assuming it was you know it was one of those things where we came quite early so people wanted to especially for bars opening at five and you get people in already that I'm going to be paying money for beers. It probably works out better for them. So we end up paying, I think, a euro for a beer. And then you'd spend 25, no, 20, 20 minutes speaking in Spanish, 20 minutes speaking in English, like back and forth in each bar. It was fucking cool, man. So, and then I finally did a race. So I did a race. By the time I did a race on Sunday, and then I basically flew out the evening after the half marathon. So I had a kind of a packed day, packed weekend, but I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't really get to see nothing. And the other time I went as well, I didn't really enjoy it either. But then... I went to Madrid in between the, the third time. So I went I went to Barcelona twice, then I went to Madrid, and I went to Barcelona again. So when I went to ba ba Madrid the, the, the first time, I was like, wow, this is the real Spain. Plus, I was with the brunette, so she introduced me to all her friends. I got to see kind of like the the underbelly of, of Madrid, kind of got to see where all the kind of local hipsters hang out, where all the cool kids hang out. I got to kind of see where, um, I don't know, just, just generally got a good vibe from it, right? And then when I went to Barcelona again for Primavera, I was like, okay, cool, like, now I see what see I prefer. Barcelona for that festival primavera is probably the best, right? Because it's so small. Um, you can basically get away. You can basically get around Barcelona for the most part on a bicycle. It's basically one long... It kind of reminds me of Brighton, it, the setup. It's sort of like one long strip, right? One long kind of um, rectangular sort of strip. So you can kind of get around it really easily. And for the most part, most of the main clubs are kind of set up in the... Or the main areas you want to kind of hang out are kind of set up in the same sort of areas, like downtown, El Gotico. Like they're kind of set up in these little pockets so you can... You can kind of figure out where you want to go and you can kind of figure out what you want to see and then, then figure out where you want to go and kind of just stay there. So, but for a festival, it's perfect. Madrid might be a bit too big for a festival. But in terms of hanging out and having some food and drinking and just having a good time, Madrid is such a cool time, man. Like, I, 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 I can't stress how great of a time Madrid is. So amazing. Great food, great people. And if I'm honest too, if you really want to learn Spanish, Madrid is a good place to go to because for the most part, not not many people speak English really, apart from the young, apart from the youngsters, and some of the youngsters don't even speak that much English either. Some of my brunette, the brunette friends didn't really speak that much English or didn't really want to bother, you know, stressing their head about how to translate words to English. So that that again put a fire up my belly to learn Spanish again, and I'm currently, actually, with my book, relearning some Spanish. Hold on, uh, where is it? Nah, it's somewhere around you anyway, but I can't exactly find it. Maybe not the best idea to turn my back to the camera. For those of you watching on YouTube. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'm currently relearning Spanish again. I picked up my um, um, my Spanish books and I'm going to try and give it another go, man. I, especially with Primavera coming up next week. Uh, I've got two weeks just to kind of brush up on my Spanish. And again, it's not about learning 
uh, Spanish in two weeks. Don't get me wrong, but I just want to brush up on it because I've already got I've got a bit of a base. I kind of can understand where conversations are going from. I kind of do want to get an understanding of how to order things, especially when you go to bars. I kind of want to show for my friends. You know what I mean? Th- those little things that you want to do. So that should be great. But yeah, what a great time! I really enjoyed Madrid. We had some amazing, 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 amazing food. We had some things that some thing called El, El Capacho. What's it called? El Capacho. Let me try and get it up on here and I can show you the stuff that I've been eating. Um, if, you're, if you're not watching this on, on YouTube, then fair enough. But I'll just kind of get this up on here for the most part and see if this works. Show up here somewhere. I'm going to come on my Facebook page. I kind of had all the stuff on there. But yeah, um, I enjoyed it, man. I absolutely love Madrid. And it's a place I'd actually live. I'd be happy to live in Madrid, man. If, if, if I get the option to kind of... Uh, kind of uh go my own route right have be able to sustain myself through some sort of means whether it's dj whether it's all the social media shit that i'm doing something that allowed me to kind of work remotely i'd love to do it in spain especially especially if you imagine if you'd be able if i was able to get paid the same salary that i am now and also live in spain that would be uh, that would be absolutely insane so let me just have a quick scan through my facebook and i can show you the picture that i uploaded in terms of the food that i was eating in el spanio I just go up here. Let me see if it works. I just go up here. Click on my photos. How many people actually use Facebook? I don't usually use it that much. I use it mostly for events. You know, um, the events that I kind of, events that I kind of put on or stuff that I want to look at. Uh, especially when I go somewhere. That's usually the only reason why I use it. I don't really use it for the most part. I kind of, I've kind of gone off it for the most part. I don't, I don't know. Maybe some, maybe some of you guys out there are still using the old, the old fa- face of the book. Anyway, I hope you can see this on the screen now. But I had this for breakfast, right? And if you can't, I'm going to try and describe it for you on the audio. So what it was, it was sort of like a, a, a bread, a toaster, a toasty, right? Which they put ha- which they put a bit of butter, a bit of um, amazing uh, Spanish ham and a fried egg. And then they kind of cut a hole in the top of the toaster and you can see the yolk popping through. Not sure how they made it. Maybe they might have made it in a plancha, in like a flat, in a flat grill. So you kind of maybe, you know, you kind of put the toast on there, you fry it on both sides, you put the egg on top, and then you kind of cut the hole, maybe with a little stamp on there. Absolutely tasty. It's making me my mouth drawn out. It's like, oh, and it's got cheese in it too. I forgot to say. So it's got uh, ham, cheese, and egg. Like, absolutely sublime. And you know what I realized too about Spain, which we don't have a lot, we don't do here in England, or I do too much here in England. They don't have a tendency to garnish stuff. We garnish stuff, or I do anyway. I'm always putting mayo, ketchup, uh brown sauce whatever or whatever you call it on my thing to kind of make it more tasty but the flavors in the food are so prominent that you don't need anything you just probably need a bit of salt and you're done that's it if anything in your food i didn't garnish anything and i thought i needed something you know but you don't need it when you eat spanish food so this was amazing had this in a cafe for the most part we generally had like a a small breakfast and then like a big lunch a big lunch slash dinner that's kind of how they do it in spain for the most part whereas we have in england we usually have like a breakfast lunch and dinner but I use anyway because I do um, intermittent fasting where I kind of eat it within a specific time window. I usually use I usually have a big breakfast and I have like a light lunch dinner and then I kind of fast until the, the next day. So I kind of follow the same sort of template in some in some parts. Um, the next thing I had was a Spanish tortilla, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, which is kind of a, a mix, a kind of pu- a pie with egg and with egg and potato in it. Um, there's a there's a very particular science to it. Spanish people take their tortillas very very seriously, and places get completely written off with their tortilla shit. Some people like the tortilla to be a bit runny, so the egg is not well not as well done as some places. Other people like the egg to be really well done. Some people um, like the potatoes to be a bit crispy. Some people like to be a bit soft. There's a very particular mix to it. Me, I I, I quite like it in the middle. You know, I'm I'm a bit of a middler guy. So I like the eggs to be a bit runny, but not super runny. I like the potatoes to be soft, but not like soggy. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of a bit in the middle. And obviously to add injury to insult with the old carb amounts, you get two bits of bread on it and an amazing little coffee, which I'm, I'm sure, I'm not sure if you can see at the back, but a little coffee that's called a cortado or cortado, I think it's called something along those lines. It's a little tiny shot of an espresso that really gets your um, endocrine system firing. Um, oh, courgettes as well. Where these courgettes, right? fucking tasty as f right amazing amazing thing so these little breaded courgettes with like i'm assuming it's some sort of cheese and potato mixture right and then it's sprinkled with it's, it's sprinkled with diced up parma ham and then that's sort of like battered and then deep fried and then you get it hot piping piping hot for the most part it's never it's never pre-made no it's, it's never 
they never reheat they never reheat them they always like to, so if they've got them already breaded they just deep, put them in a deep fryer and you get them ready to go some places that make really good um courgettes they run out of them so when you really go to order they'll be run out they'll have anything more which i love about spain too which shows you stuff isn't made and then reheat it again it's all made to order they make a particular batch for the day and when it's done it's done if, if there's some left there's some left that's basically it and then last but not least we had this thing called uh oh um my friend left the comment actually it's called a cachopo cat, cachopo yeah it's called cachopo right and what it basically is like um what's that it's, it's like a ch chicken kiev but done like insane level so it's sort of like a uh a kind of a breaded hammy kind of thing on the outside and then on the inside you've got the parma ham with cheese like in the middle so then when you're eating it the cheese is just oozing out oh my god my lips are dribbling now i'm salivating now thinking about it it's so tasty amazingly tasty and, and it came with uh a side of i'm sure if you can if you're watching a youtube video you can see at the back it came with a side of fries and um uh, peppers that are kind of sprinkled with salt like they're flipping amazing these little green peppers i think we're gonna have a few of them when we go to barcelona they're like they're like popcorn you know what i mean you just, keep, you just keep eating them for days and days so that was most of that was predominantly the food i was eating when i was in madrid um just an abundance an abundance an abundance of carbohydrates and anything fried and deep fried and some really good food man like i had some good sandwiches had, had a good burger had a nice pizza from a shop like just a little frozen pizza we put in the oven that was really really tasty and yeah man it's, it's a place where you can go and get fat and be happy but they've also got great parks i can imagine myself running through parks and having a good time there which is really really int which, is, which is really crucial too and they've got uh, loads of hilly places they can go and do sp um, hill sprints in i know there's probably something that probably a lot of people won't really care about you know like if you go into spain why would you want to exercise but i highly recommend you do because if you if not you turn into an absolute door so that was my spanish encounter and yeah i can't wait to go back again next week it's going to be an amazing trip and I've, I've, been, I've been really fortunate these last couple of weeks actually in terms of holidays and places i've been going i uh, went to Barcelona, i went to berlin for a bit for a weekend um obviously went to madrid with the brunette the other week and now I'm going to get to barcelona it's amazing just how much you can do with little you know i booked these holidays quite far in advance but i'm also getting by with just doing you can do a lot with a little money you know like if if you really want to and i'm really happy that i'm able to do this now and I don't know. I'm just in a good place, man. It's just, it's just nice. I think vacations are super important. Um, obviously, this is the festival and I'm going specifically for the music, but I don't know, man. There's something really nice about going away on trips and having having some fun times with your pals and your friends. Let me get... I want to get the flyer, too, so I can see what the people that are playing. But I'm really looking forward to Primavera Sound, by the way, too. I think it's going to be an amazing, an amazing, amazing, amazing time. Let me try and get up this uh, flyer now to see what I want to see blah de blah blah actually let's get up on here on images primavera sound 2018 but it's gonna be so many good people playing there's not it's not I mean it's not even a a question about whether it's gonna be good or not man it's gonna be awesome so primavera sound 2018 here we bloody go right so looking forward to seeing a lot of people there's gonna be a lot of acts that i haven't seen previously um what, what, what do we have on Wednesday? We have Wednesday, what do we, no, we have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? Is that Thursday, Friday, Saturday? No, Saturday, no, sorry. We have Thursday, yeah, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So, on Saturday, on Friday is what we have, right? We've got Bjork, Nick Cave, The War on Drugs, Vince Staples, Churches, Fever, Floating Points, Forte, War Paint, um, Un Unknown Mortal or or Orchestra, Khalil, DJ Coz, Sparks, Mount Kimball, Madlib, right? Uh... Saturday, we've got the Nationals, Migos, Tyler the Creator, Haim, Charlotte Gainsborough, which I it was super awesome to look forward to. She's so, so hot. Uh, Father John Misty, Arca, Magal, The Internet, Mike D, Cigarettes After Six, The Breeders, Panda and the Bear, uh, Ty Siegel, which would be fucking sick. I can't wait to see Ty Siegel. I've been a big fan of his for a while. Chromio, which would be awesome. Daphne, uh, Thundercat, fucking awesome. Aim, back to back with Aim. Black Madonna DJing, 666. Six, six. And then on Friday, and then on Saturday, sorry, we got Lord, we got Arctic Monkeys, Lord, ASAP Rocky, Likey Lee, Beach House, Grizzly Bear, Jane, Bikini. Now, the problem I have is that I haven't seen any three of the hip hop acts live ever in my life. Migos, Tyler Crow, ASAP Rocky. So I want to see all three, but I also want to see loads of bands. So I've got a, it's going to be a real toss up between how I kind of get this sorted out. Because I remember last time round, 
I got to see uh, Mac DeMarco, right, at last year, Primavera, which is one of my kind of heroes. I, I'm really looking forward. I was really happy to see him play live. And he really did disappoint. And those people here I want to see live in terms of band wise and like Ty, Ty Siegel, uh, Cigarettes After Sex, uh, The War on Drugs, Haim even. There's a few other bands here I would also want. Oh, Majid Jordan are playing too, which would be fucking awesome. So there's a lot of people to play that are going to try. But we need to kind of balance it out. They've got a timetable and a timesheet. And they've got this like clash thing that you can kind of use as well. I think that's part of the app. So you can find the times. It shows you who's playing and where you might clash. But the site is huge, man. The site is absolutely huge at Primavera. I'll try and get that up, actually. So maybe you guys can check that out. Uh, Primavera Sound 2018 uh, site map. It's absolutely huge site, so it's going to be difficult maybe to kind of get around and kind of see everything, but hopefully we'll make it work. And it's the kind of place where it, it, it's really big, it's annoying, but it kind of works, you know, and it kind of, you, you, you are thankful for it because there's so much room, but you do have to walk a lot to get to anywhere you want to get to. That's 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 without a shadow of a doubt, man. Oh, they, got two, oh, they don't have the 2018 one yet. Hold on, let me go and Reddit and see. Maybe not someone might have uploaded it on there. Preinverse sound on Reddit. Let's see if the map is on there. Blah, 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 blah. Sometimes searching on the internet while doing a podcast isn't the most efficient way to use your time on a podcast. But hey, it's a long form podcast, so you guys should hang around. See, they've got the map, 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 map. Nope, map, budget, trams, routes, blah, blah, blah. See if anyone's got a map on here. Da, 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 da. The map is out. Okay, cool. Here we go. Sounds like we're the map. So the Primverse site is quite big, as you can see. I'm sure. Hopefully, you can see on the on. Hopefully, this is showing on OBS. But um, so the the site is huge, mate. Absolutely huge, right? Such a big site. You've got yeah. So your main. This is kind of the main arena, right? And where's the main bit? Yeah, this is sort of the main bit where you kind of come in. I think around. Is it around there? Where was it? Bit no, it's around here. Sorry, this is the main sort of bit. You come in through the street, and it's absolutely huge, mate so 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 big to get around all the stages and stuff but i'm really looking forward to it man i really 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 cannot wait um going with a few friends so that should be good too and we've got like a good little crew with us as well so we've got one member of the group who isn't gonna be super uh getting drunk or anything so that's gonna be able to kind of like keep us a bit tempered as a group overall and then overall i think being there from thursday till sunday too or Monday was going to help. And we've got that Monday to kind of like, you know, decompress and the Sunday also. So that's going to be awesome. The Sunday's really good too because you've got that guy called DJ Coco who plays an amazing set towards the end. He plays loads of kind of electro and indie sort of stuff at the end of the set. Really, really good DJ. I really recommend you check. I actually can't recommend checking him out. I don't really know where he's his info. I remember I tried to get it before when, when we came back, but I couldn't find it. But he's a really good DJ and it should be a good time overall. And yeah. Take more vac vacations if you're kind of a bit down and dumb, especially in, during the summer. What I've I've I found anyway, what working full time during the summer, you always gonna get bummed out because you always feel like you should be outside doing shit, right? Like today, I feel you know today's a, one of those kind of blessing days where I'm kind of at home and I'm off today. But for the most part, if you're working nine to five, you always feel as if like oh my god, I should be somewhere else. But I always say the good way to temper and to balance it is to kind of take some time out during the weekends or even during the week, and or maybe book some holiday off. Try and save it as you as much as you can for the for, for the summer, and take some short trips away, man. It doesn't necessarily need to be Barcelona. It could be anywhere else you want. You know what I mean? There's loads of stuff happening in Rome, loads of stuff happening in places in Portugal, such as Porto and Lisbon. They've got some great little festivals there. They've got a few things coming up obviously in Croatia. But I'd recommend going to kind of kind of place, especially getting first to music that you're not necessarily into, meeting new people. It's always super 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 fun. So yeah, looking forward to Primavera, and I can not wait. Anyway, on to the topic that I've um, kind of specced out for today's podcast. Let me get my little notes up so we can go through this stuff. Number one, Tyrone the Scammer graduates from Howard University. All right, so I'm not sure if you guys are aware, right? But there was this guy um, from Howard University that everyone was sort of saying um, had embezzled cash from the student union or something, right? And his name was Tyron Hankerson Jr. Now, you might have not seen him, but or you might not remember, but this is the guy that was, like, taking some really, like, outlandish pictures on, on social media, you know? Like, he was jumping, he was, like, wearing, like, really, really amazing clothes, standing next to an expensive car, jumping, and just, like, you know, just living, living a life of Riley. 
and you know he people were saying he's sort of like the finesse king right but it's now transpired that maybe he got set up like this is the guy that we're talking about right tyrone he, like looks amazing in his in his outfits right <laughs> he had all these early pictures and i think basically what happened i think someone was investigating the how university student kind of i don't know um the people that give you the money whether they are the student loans or the guys that kind of give you the money they were kind of investigating him and they kind of found out that maybe he was the guy that was embezzling loads of money from the student union uh his name kind of got dragged through the mud on social media but now it's transpired that he's actually innocent right so and he's actually innocent and he's suing this college for loads and loads of money and he graduated and he gave like an interview with cbs and sort of highlighted um how much of a pain has been going through this kind of sort of scandal and it i don't know it's it, it kind of shines a light on the idea of like sometimes when you've been when you've been accused of something it's really hard to shake off that kind of stigma around you you know like he's been accused of something he might it might not be true he might have been set up but you know the per, the perception of him out there is that he's a bit he's a scammer he's a finesse he kind of like you know he's a huckster he, tr- he took some money from students but this picture just made me laugh when i saw it when he kind of came on social media i was like shit what the fuck happened i thought he was a i thought he was a bad guy how come he graduated from university but it's such a great picture i'm happy that he kind of you know was able to graduate but the sort of follow-up video kind of went under the radar because you know that people just saw kind of the image but this follow-up video was quite interesting he was kind of take on the whole situation and hopefully i'll play it now and you can kind of maybe hear it through the speakers students at howard university are protesting for the sixth day in a row occupying the school's administrative building the group hu resist is leading the protest it started after an anonymous blog post alleged that nearly a million dollars in financial aid money was misused. The university acknowledged that it launched a... All right, so my bad, it was, it was aid money. Now, we, we know that happens all the time at universities, right? There's no way... Some I went to Central St. Martins for the most part, right? And it was an absolute dump. The one in... They, they had a campus in... Um, oh, Tottenham Court Road. I forgot what the, what, the, what the place is called again. Um, the street. Anyway, I went to that campus, right? It was an absolute dump. And we were paying... It was like one of the most prestigious, like if you don't know Central St. Martins, it's probably one of the most prestigious art colleges in the world. It's now under the umbrella of U- UAL, which is the University of Arts London. And everyone and their mum wants to uh, apply there because, you know, very, very influential designers um, have have kind of graduated from there, such as Alexander McQueen, blah, 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 blah. blah. It's the university that Kanye West was famously turned down for uh, by Louis Wilson, RIP, um, kind of the influential fashion director. Um, sorry, the influential. What, what, what was she for the MA course? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was it, it was a very prestigious, uh, creative university. Everyone went to go in there, or oh, get in there, <laughs> and uh, tuition fees are really high. But the equipment was so shabby. We had seats that were broken. The printer didn't work too great. Um, some of the rooms didn't have adequate heating, and it just didn't make sense. So it was for sure, you know, some of that money was being embezzled or kind of being misused to some extent. So I think this is a problem that's not even affected, that's affecting probably universities, uh, the world, world around. Like, how do you account for some of the money just uh, come, that just pours in consistently, but the equipment around you doesn't necessarily affect the sums of money you guys are paying. So nice to see these kind of students protesting and sort of like kicking up a fuss, but it's kind of hard to pin down who is really responsible for these kind of things really, in it for the most part, because you never really know. An investigation and subsequently fired six employees, but students say school officials should have been more transparent. One student who has been caught up in this scandal says he is innocent. Tyrone Hankerson Jr. There he is, look at him. (laughs) He's innocent, and he's lawyer. Walker is in Atlanta. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Tyrone, let me start with you. A blog post on the site Medium accused you of embezzling $429,000 in that's that's the problem I have nowadays too, right? I think um who mentioned it? Uh oh, I think no, Steve Stout mentioned it recently in an interview with Hot Ninety Seven, right? Um Steve Stout, famously the guy that sort of like uh brought fifty cent to Reebok to do the G unit sneakers and shit. He's been responsible for loads of kind of endorsement deals of your biggest artists, your biggest hip hop acts out there, right? He he wrote this book called The Tanning of America, which is a really good book that kind of described the the kind of resurgence of hip-hop within popular culture and you know nowadays hip-hop is kind of the number one music listen in for the most part in north america is it or the world anyway he mentioned something on that interview with hot 97 where he said that he was speaking to jay-z one day and jay-z said to him that th- the issue that he has with the internet or nowadays is that there's no difference between blogging and journal and journalism they're both the same thing so someone can write something about you in a blog 
and a reporter can ask you a question like it's a credible source about that article that there's someone wrote about in a you know, blog, right? And a blog post, for the most part, is an opinion piece or it's something based on rumours. It's never usually something that's gone through um, a rigorous journal- journalistic process, right? Where you kind of had to um, cite di- your, your sources. You've kind of had to research a story through different sources. You've kind of had to confirm or deny different parts of the story. You had to go through various various rigorous processes in order to make sure the story you're pointing out is actually true or has an aspect of truth to it. But if you write a blog post, for the most part, you can just like, you can just throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. So this guy's had his whole life torn to shreds, right, over a blog article on Medium. Now, the person on Medium might have had some info behind it, but to name someone in an article on Medium is quite responsible, I think. Maybe to allude to people that might have been responsible for the act, maybe, but to name someone <clears throat> in an article on Medium is very responsible. And look what it's done to him, you know what I mean? Like, it's thrown your whole career... Your, ed- your education to Jeopardy, and I think he mentions it in his um, talk now, because I think he graduated from, from law, so not necessarily the perception of your fellow students is going to harm you, it's perception outside professionally, right? When when Because nowadays employers are Googling you when uh, you're turning up for interview, because I know this happened to me um, previously, where I've kind of went, I've gone for an interview, and so, and the person that's interviewed me has kind of known my social media profile, knows that I have, have a Facebook page, knows that I have a podcast, knows that I have an Instagram page, knows that I have, that I have a blog, knows that I DJ, so people are Googling you just to kind of see, you know, just to kind of get an idea of what your social footprint is. So if this Tyrone guy has a social footprint where it comes up about he's embezzled fat hundreds of thousands of dollars from this university, no law firm is going to touch him with a barge pole, are they? So it's a bit annoying, but, you know, say la vie, I guess. Paid money when you were an undergraduate student. Did you embezzle that money? No, I have never embezzled any money, nor have I embezzled any money from Howard University particularly. And have you received any money at all from the school? Yes, I have received funding for my education at, um, at Howard University, but the accusations that were alleged in the article are absolutely false and not true. And so... Ha- so imagine that. They're completely not... Fa- they're false and not true. He's got his lawyer with him in the, at the office now. He's having to sue and kind of um, uh, restore his reputation. But it's so difficult nowadays, isn't it? When you allege something, it's sort of like, that's it. You get alleged and you kind of have to just... Especially if you care about what perception, the social perception is, you have to kind of just accept it that you're not going. It's never going to be the same again, which which kind of really does must hurt as well. But and especially if you're going to take people to court, it costs so much money. The process is so long, drawn out. Blah 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 blah. Um. So yeah, I feel sorry for the guy, and hopefully he gets it figured out. But when I stumbled across this picture on social, it just made me laugh. I was like, Jesus, man, how the hell did he graduate? Like it kind of, it made me kind of, it took me for a back as well. I was like, hold on, didn't he embezzle money from his university? And then the more I kind of read into the story and sort of found out what was going on, I started to realize, okay, cool. Maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't as true as people made out to be. So again, man, the dangers of blogging, I think now they push you on your social, be careful what you say, man. Um, don't be quick to name people or say that they've done a particular thing wrong, especially if you haven't got no evidence, because you know, it can kind of really fuck up people's lives. But you know, also I realized, you know, Tyrone looks a lot like my friend that I used to um that was in uh Dr. Martin's with Tyrone Mazumba. I used to work in Dr. Martins with this guy called Tyrone Mazumba, actually. He was, he was a really funny dude. He looks a lot like this Tyrone guy. Anyway, that was topic number one. What else did I wanted to speak about here? Go back on my notes. Uh, too many apologies. Let's click on this article. What is, it, what is this about? Some of these things I've been writing about for other weeks, so I kind of forgot what it's about. Oh, Gigi Hadid apologies over, the, over uh, for her Vogue Italia blackface cover. This is a story that I kind of stumbled upon somewhere. I was like, what in the fuck is going on here, right? Everyone's apologizing for everything, right? There's, an, there's, an, there's like, it's like an apology festival. But this kind of really caught me aback because it didn't really make much sense. And hopefully you guys can kind of agree where I'm coming from. So the article reads, Gigi, Gigi Hadid, who's a, obviously a famous model, she famously used to... Is this the one that used to go out with No, this is the one that goes out with Zayn Malik. Her sister Bella's one that used to go out with uh, The Weeknd, right? So these two uh, sisters who are models. So the article goes on to say, Gigi Hadid has apologised after being criticised for her heavy, heavily bronzed look on the cover of Vogue Italia. Fans said she was unrecognisable and that by darkening the model's face and body, it was an example of blackface. The picture shot by uh, photographer Stephen Klein, an amazing photographer, shows a noticeably bronze Gigi in the arms of male model Justin Martin. It, it, in an Instagram post, an Instagram story shared on Thursday, the 23-year-old said the concerns raised are valid. Now, I know, I know, I know fashion can be super, fashion people can be, um, how, how, how can they be? 
Fashion people can be a little bit blasé to the plights of minorities around the world, right? They can be a little bit blasé in terms of social issues, right? They can be a little bit um, uh, ignorant to stuff, right? But this is a bit of a stretch. Is this really blackface? Or is this just a heavily bronzed... And imagine, we're on the cover of Vogue Italia, right? For the most part, um, Italian um, fashionistas do tan a lot, right? They go on holiday a lot and they tan a lot. You only have to look at that guy, um, what's his name? Uh, Giovanni Vacci, yeah? That, uh, the old guy that everyone likes. Giovanni Vacci, is it Vacci? Gianluca Vacci, right? This guy that always has his top off and with tattoos and stuff that's always dancing around the place, right? He is heavily, heavily, heavily tanned. It's just the Italian thing. Look, for the most part, like, they like to be tanned. Look. Look how tanned my guy is. He's tanned, right? He goes, he's in the sun all the time. He's always got his top off, right? He's always hanging out. This is just what they do. They just like to be tanned, right? That's not a tanning salon, but look, look. Look at this guy. This is what Italians, for the most part, that are into fashion or into that kind of scene look like. Right, he's just heavily tanned. He might apply a little bit of bronzer on there to get more tan, but you can't say he's doing blackface. That's impossible. So how the hell did they have suddenly have to like pillar Gigi and say she, she, she's doing blackface? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, you can Google it yourself, uh, Gigi the uh, Vogue Italia cover, but it's not blackface. At, it, maybe if if she had like cane rolls on and she, I don't know, she had like big hoop earrings and a medallion or some shit, right? And just obviously trying to have a kind of a black image but this just looks like a regular fashion image i didn't really understand the, the, um the controversy right and then Gigi had to go on social media and sort of like make an apology um apologizing for what she kind of did which is i think ridiculous right she wrote this post which i'll kind of hopefully read out to you here um this is a, this photo of me returning home from shooting my vogue italia cover on on april 3rd you can see the level that i've been bronze right because obviously she's still got bronze all over her hands and some on her neck uh to on set that day please understand that my control of a shoot one is non-existent in terms of creative direction two ends completely when i leave the set and anything done in a photo in post is out of my control fully the bronzing and photoshop is a style that stephen klein has done for many years which is very very true and i believe what was expected from the shoot to show me in a different way creatively but although i understand what vertical intentions were it was not executed correctly and the concerns that have been raised are valid now it's a bit naughty from from Gigi because yes she's kind of thrown Vogue Italia and, and Stephen Clown under the bus because she does say um, at the no, uh, point number two my input ends completely when I leave the set and anything done in post is out of my control fully it's Stephen Klein's way of taking pictures right um, are they going to try and pillar Jürgen Teller and say he's appropriating Chav culture with the pictures that he takes come on dudes like really you're making Gigi apologise for being bronze on, an, on the cover of a, of a fashion magazine it's like what in the fuck is going on here man too many apologies and for the most part like i don't know she's a model she's like a a pawn in in this game she doesn't have any she doesn't have any that much input for the most part i don't know what people are really um the the people that follow Gigi hadid on social media or follow her in general should know that models don't have that much creative input in when it comes to fashion shoots anyway in general um usually the editor or the fashion director of the magazine or the editor-in-chief kind of sets the theme for each issue especially if it's a monthly issue uh they sort of you know they will go out and commission particular f photographers to take a particular shoot they might come up with a particular concept the photographer might have a relationship with a particular model a particular stylist and then they kind of you know that team sort of constructs the fashion image or the cover or the editorial or the campaign, whatever they may be, and then it goes out. But the model has zero to no input in that shoot. She might have an input in terms of the poses she strikes, right? There might be some stuff that she'll do, or he or she will do. Um, they might improvise some things, right? They might be on, on location somewhere. The photographer might have wanted something on a tree. The model might kind of running into uh, up a hill somewhere. They might hang off a branch. They might do something a little bit creative for that in terms of poses. But for the most part, the the creative director editor-in-chief the photographer itself the stylist the assistants they set the precedent for what they want the image to look like and having somebody in a bit of fake tan on a on a, on a cover of vogue italia right for the most part they have the same sort of image every month anyway right if you look back on the archives the images they're usually kind of the same sort of like baroque um overly embellished 
extremely luxurious looking style like kind of like barmain right very very rich looking skin um loads of accessories loads of jewelry loads of spark loads of bling this is what they do so why is she having to apologize for this it's absolutely nuts what we what we're doing nowadays man like people are apologizing for the most minute thing everyone has to apologize for oh i'm sorry for this sorry for that like and what it ends up doing in my opinion is it ends up cheapening the apology because now for the most part whenever people do apologize everyone is kind of quick to say oh that apology sounds like something uh, a lawyer or a publicist would write well what do you expect you're yeah, expecting everyone to apologize over things they don't necessarily need to apologize over and then when do when they do apologize in a very robotic way because they don't really feel like they should but they kind of have to to kind of you know go through the process of like okay i, I you have to it's these sort of hurdles you have to you have to jump over right the sort of like you know the social media silence the apology the saying you're going to learn and grow from it the appearance on some sort of tv show or maybe a post that's sort of highlighting some other people's you know um uh, shortcomings blah, blah 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 a time of quiet and you come back you know i've grown i've learned I've, i'm older more mature blah, blah 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 it's a particular hurdle you have to go through but i just think it's a bit of it's crazy especially with social media now like everyone has a voice everyone is kind of looking to get upset about something right or even looking to get upset about something or get behind something right so when that ice bucket challenge happened everyone wants to do it because it's on social media everyone's doing it i want to do it too or you want to get upset about something because everyone else is getting upset about it. I want to rally behind it and show how much disdain I have for this particular thing. And it's just getting a little bit nuts, man. I think people need to just chill the F out. Like, relax. Take it bloody easy. It's not that serious. GG's on the cover. The suit's pretty amazing. The, the, the photo shoot's really nice. Like, I don't know. I feel sorry for the last minute. Imagine having to apologize for putting some bronzer on on the fashion image. It's like, meh. Crazy. Anyway. Oh, before we continue, talking about fashion... I got some new shoes. I got some new shoes. It's been a long time since I bought some new shoes. The last shoes that I bought a, a while ago were these. I'm quick over and get them. These Mars Yards, right? Tom Sachs Mars Yards. The last shoes I've got. Let me get this image out of the way. These last shoes I got, right? Last ones. I've loved them. They're amazing. I've written them. I've written them on the side, like everyone else has. You know, I beat them up. I put them in a wash recently, and um, they didn't come out that great. But hey, uh, they didn't really get that clean, to be honest. But I absolutely love these. I wear them all the bloody time. They're probably one of my favorite shoes. And I can't wait because they've got a mid coming out, haven't they? I think they've got like a mid um, model coming out that's sort of like black and white. So I can't wait for those to come out very, very soon. But I love these shoes, right? But I've been beating them up so much. And I kind of wanted a, a pair of shoes that I can wear, especially with Primavera. I kind of always like to have a pair of new shoes, right? um you know it's a festival man why not let's go crazy so i've got a pair of new shoes for the festival and i've been i've, I've had my eye on these shoes for such a long time right i've been wearing them for ages but i just couldn't uh pull the trigger then then just before they released the, for the second time i went on stockx and i kind of stockx is one of the best websites right i highly recommend you check it out stockx.com great website it's sort of like what flight club promised to be but even better right flight club was this consignment store where people would go and sell and resell their sort of like hype uh, pieces of clo uh, pieces of footwear for the most part. So when the whole like tier zero and limited edition shoes were kind of dropping all over the place, it was a good place to get your shoes. But they were quite overpriced because everyone was looking to get the biggest markup possible they wanted on it. And especially with eBay uh, being as unpredictable as it is, sometimes people pay, some people people don't, sometimes people pay for something, then they open a dispute on PayPal. You get a bit uh, dubious. But StockX is a great site because they kind of aggregate the prices of of uh of shoes based on the kind of market value people list them on there and you can kind of give them an offer um so it kind of reminds me a little bit of how we used to do it on the forums right um sometimes people do it as well on, on facebook groups so you can kind of make an offer on a particular shoe or someone can say if you want to you, you can make an offer on a box logo hoodie like you know he's open to offers and whoever, whoever ha offers the most highest or the amount that the person's willing to let the thing go for you kind of buy and on StockX. You can also track the prices of things depending on whether or not they get re-released or retro, right? And plus, some shoes, they get re-released a few times. Like, I don't know. Like, let's for instance, uh, uh, Jordan Cement Freeze, right? They're coming out again soon. So if you track Jordan Cement Freeze, especially the 2014 model, you can maybe get them for a little bit cheaper when because when they when they re-release again, the original ones might go down a bit because they'll be a little bit more they'll be more available on the market and then as soon as they sell out um from the stores and generally they kind of swap hands the price is kind of increased again so you kind of have to be really really precise and you kind of really have to watch the market and kind of like put your bid in quickly so with these shoes i tracked the prices of them i saw that they're re-releasing again on, on the on loads of sites again and I was able to snag them for just above retail. Um, so they came up to about 350 uh, altogether and they got released and they got and they arrived to me in about a week uh, from the US. 
And if you're wondering the pair I got, I got the Wave Runner 700s. Yay! I'm so happy with them. As you can see, I've already beat them up and worn them over a period of a week. Uh, but I don't really mind. You know, I like wearing my shoes. I don't, I don't really like care take. I'm not really big on uh, being overly pressured with my trainers. But I'm so happy with these shoes, man. I've, I've loved them ever since the first time I saw uh, Kanye wearing them. And I saw the kind of initial kind of first prototype images of them. I thought they were absolutely amazing. If anything, they're probably the epitome of what a dad shoe is probably meant to look like for me. They're extremely light. They're very, very comfortable, uh, super chunky. Um, they have a um, really, really wide forefoot that really helps my feet because I tend to, my feet are quite big. I've got like a UK 10, US 11, sometimes US 11.5. But for the most part, my toes are what really um, uh, hinder me fitting into most shoes because especially if you're looking at Air Maxes or Air Force, not Air Force, Air Maxes for the most part and Converse and Vans, they're very pointy, right, at the front. So sometimes my feet can get a bit scrunched up. So these really help. They're really, really flat at the front. I love the idea that they kind of really flat at the front here as well. The kind of um, fourth, the kind of the front of the toe box because I remember the issue that I had a lot with the Nike retros from the years gone by is that they've always had this weird banana foot thing that kind of always point up. I never understood why. Because when you look at images of retro shoes from the 90s, especially catalog images, they always have this very amazing flat kind of silhouette at the front. I love that they're really color heavy at the front, right? They've got a lot of color blocking right here at the front and kind of less at the back, sort of like a bit more tonal. But in here you have black, green, blue, and gray. Whereas here you just have like two colors for the most part, you know, gray and black. I love the laces, the sort of neon laces, and and just the whole overall lack of branding. I think Kanye's done an amazing job of just having no obvious bits of branding. There's no, like, even if you look on the outside, there's no, like, free dots anywhere. Like, you would think if this is an Aida shoe that they produced, they'd have, like, three dots to kind of symbolize the three stripes. There's two, there's two, there's about four dots here, but there's no free stripes anywhere until you look inside. You've got, like, the kind of Adidas logo in there, right? And then you've got the Adidas logo on the, on the bottom of the shoe. And you've got the Yeezy sign just inside the, the tag in here that you can't really make out. But absolutely love these. Um, so Yeezy Wave Runner 700s, one of my favorite shoes. I'll probably end up doubling up on these again uh, just because I know I'm going to wear them at, wear them in. They're probably the same rate that I'm going to wear these in. I just think shoes look better anyway once you wore them in. So I'm really, really happy with, with both shoes. But this is a shoe that I've been wanting for a long, long, long time. So I'm super, 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 super happy that I've got these for the, for the moment. And yeah, I'm gonna wear these for Primavera, man. Like the best shoes ever. Really, really comfortable. And yeah, man. Like, for, say what you like about Kanye and his, um, you know, his media outbursts and whatever. But he knows how to make great shoes. I think for the most part, these, the three fifties, um, the kind of uh, the Desert Rats that are out too. I really, really look, absolutely like. Actually, I like. Let me just show you those. Actually, those are absolutely sick. Right, they've got these Desert Rats. That I really want to get a pair of. They look amazing. I think they were in stock for a while. I'm not sure if they're out of stock again, but let's see if they're in stock. Yeah, they're still in stock, right? So hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, the Desert Rats. What are they, what are they called? Uh, the Thick Desert Boot, right? So they're not called Desert Rats. They're called just Desert Boot. These are really, really nice. I really like these. Um, and they've got another color too that I want in brown. I think they still got, still got this. Yeah, they've still got these in brown too. Did they have them in my size still? Nah, no in my size on here, but they might have the blacks in my size, so I probably might get these very very soon i don't have my size either but yeah i'm a 45 if anyone is asking so these are my favorite shoes right now absolutely love these as well and other, again no hardly any branding on them right very very minimal but this is the perfect 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 boot he's really kind of honed that sort of like army boot style that he was wearing for a while so um yeah these are great shoes cannot wait to get another pair anyway enough about the shoes on with the next topic on the docket uh what else I wanted to talk about here? If they struggle going on a break, they're not obviously going on a break. Now I've seen on social media that they're actually going to come back. Um, for the most part, I don't really care. I think I've stopped watching Everyday Struggle. When you know when Joe Biden left, it kind of got a bit shit anyway. The the whole reason why you watched it because of that dynamic between Joe Biden and Act. You know that they're, they're musically they're on completely different planes. Understanding of the industry, they're on completely different planets, and just general perspective on life. It's just interesting to see them butt heads. They've got this guy on there, Wayno, who's supposed to be meant to be a regular addition too because he's kind of, you know, from the same generation as, as Joe and has a similar perspective. And he kind of differs on a lot of things with Ak as well. But for the most part, I'm not really interested in keeping up to date with everything that's happening on Instagram with these, like, you know, Lils and Lils over. And for the most part, I've been trying to limit my um, my news input anyway. Like, I'm not, I'm not really trying to see everything that's out there. I'm trying to kind of keep myself 
to myself for the most part and see things whenever they come across my social stream when they're meant to come across my social stream um being inundated with information sometimes is a bit much especially if you if i'm especially if you're reading as many books as i have or if many books sorry that sounded completely egotistical especially if you're trying to read as many books as i'm trying to read now i don't really have time to kind of like sit down and watch tv shows about or online shows about what's happening generally with these kind of young rappers and influencers and all the likes of it but for the most part most of the news is not something i'm really that interested in anyway especially when it's like a, a play-by-play uh report on the next the, you know the next victim of six nine or whatever maybe i'm not really involved in that kind of stuff so um that was the next part okay but what else have i got in here that's interesting oh meet me on interview with um with uh breakfast club which is really really good right so i'm gonna i think i've got a timestamp of when i went to talk about here i think it's at 14 33 but let me just pause this and i can talk to you about it now 14 33 pause this um so as you guys i'm sure you guys are aware meek mill recently released from prison um he's had a bit of a check he's had a bit of a checkered pass with the old you know um prison system he said this weird thing where he said he's been on parole for like what 10 years or something for a crime he did you know a long 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 time ago and his case has basically highlighted a lot of the problems with the prison uh system in general especially when it comes to minorities in america because you know he's been very honest and said if he wasn't a celebrity if he didn't have the friends that he has who are backing him on the outside then he probably wouldn't have been released so soon he's not he's he's very pally pally with the owner of the philadelphia whatever basketball team they're called and obviously he signed to rock nation jay-z was um written op-ed piece uh based on prison reform that mentioned meek mill for the new york times uh beyonce name checked him in the song so he had a lot of people kind of like fighting his battles right um drake who famously beef with uh mentioned in the concert that he wanted meek mill to be free too blah 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 but it's an interesting interview because i was one of the people who wrongly for the most part said that he had broken probation he obviously knew it's a probation and he was just doing silly things, right? Because the reason why he got locked up again, the most recent time, the reason why he um, violated his probation was because he was in New York with his friends and he decided to do a wheelie on a quad bike uh, in the middle of the street, right? And this is something that he does a lot, right? It's the kind of bike life crew thing. It's very, it's a very big part. It's a very big part of the culture in Philadelphia. People ride motorbikes and quad bikes and stuff in the street, do crazy stunts, you know, do the whole like balancing on one knee on the back of a motorcycle, doing a wheelie, high speeds, doing no hands, blah, blah, blah doing it backwards. So, but he's really good on the bike. Meek Mill's like a very, very skilled, um, you know, trick bike rider. Or whatever you, I don't know how, whatever you call those people that do those kind of things. But some people, and uh, m- myself included, were saying, you know, he was on probation. So why would he be so silly and do a wheelie on a on motorbike in the middle of the street? But he raises some good points saying, you know, even though he was he was silly what he'd done, would that constitute him going to prison for, I don't know, the best part of six months, whatever it might have been, right? He went to a federal, like a, a proper prison where he was, you know, sitting alongside rapists and murderers for a crime for breaking a probation for a crime he did like years and years and years ago so it kind of highlighted a lot of the things that are very wrong with the prison system in the united states and also you know it kind of makes you sad thinking about the people that aren't as famous as meek mill who kind of get um who kind of make a mistake when they're young or do something that they're not meant to do and sort of end up in this spiral um in prison you know kind of coming out breaking probation going back in again uh, being on the run, blah blah blah, and cons- and especially they've not have the ability to rap or to do anything creative. Having to, you know, get a job with you know ha- being a felon and having that on your case must be very very difficult too. But there's a part that I kind of highlighted that I wanted to speak about. Which one was it? Whoops, keeps coming out here. Let's put this back in. Uh, fourteen thirty three. This is the part that I kind of want you guys to listen to. So I'm going to play this from now and see what the topic was. So I can refresh my memory. know what you're doing with that instagram how you be living how you be glossing he said i see how you're trying to inspire and you're using it to catch people younger eye and inspire i'm like yeah that's my thing because you know with the younger people it's just certain stuff you could do to catch their eye and like when i read a lot of my mail uh, everything was based on me inspiring somebody or me motivating somebody but he was like it's a world of people that's looking at looking at that and it's making them hate you you know what i'm saying he said and i know they're looking at it like it's ignorant he said i know what you're doing but he like it's two different sides mm-hmm. of that. And some people will look down on you like, who the hell this kid think he is? Uh? Now, that really hit home to me, right? Because I remember there was a period of time 
point I remember, but there was a period of time where I was kind of, I kind of got put off Meek Mill for the most part because I felt like he was perpetuating this image of black people, especially um, people that were kind of trying to come up in the industry or trying to come up in general in life, right? Who are fighting for their dreams, being a dream chase, whatever it may be. And he perpetuated this idea that any, the only thing we wanted were the jewels, the private cars, the mansions, the fancy clothes, and the big watches, right? But he would always defend his position and say that where he comes from and the kids that he's speaking to, the guys that are in the trap, the guys that are like always getting in trouble with the police, the guys that are in gangs and stuff, they only respond to that kind of imagery. And then he hopes that once he kind of does a whole flashy car and flashy watches thing, when he gets them in, he then can kind of educate them um, about investing in stocks, buying property, launching a brand, blah, 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 blah. Sort of the same sort of, the same sort of way uh, Ty Lopez does what he does, right? The Ty Lopez guy where he kind of films videos in his garage surrounded by books and, and a Lamborghini or with a really hot girl or whatever it may be, right? Or in a big, really big house or in this amazing location somewhere abroad, right? That's his way to kind of get you into his funnel. And then from there, he can kind of sell you an ebook or some sort of online program, whatever it may be, right? So it had these critics. But I think for the most part, what interesting about the Meat Mill story is that he mentioned in this interview with Breakfast Club that the judge on his case is some is a person who grew up in his area. Because I think Charlemagne mentioned something about um, what's happened with this judge. Like, why has she got such a boner for you? Like, why is she so hot on your case? Because, you know, this judge is, you know, she's been involved. There's been rumors about this judge being a bit corrupt. She's demanded that... Meek Mill make a, uh, what's that, uh, as a, a video for her son or something, and he didn't do it, and supposedly that was what kind of set her off and kind of made her have this mission of make, making sure she takes him down, blah, blah, blah. But Meek Mill mentions that he doesn't know what the issue is between her, the judge and himself, but he does know the judge's family grew up in the same area that he grew up in, right? So this kind of makes me think that what uh, Jay-Z's associate, Tata, told him that, you know, maybe... You need to kind of chill out on the whole like flashing and stuff on social media because it's going to rub people, some people out the wrong way. Maybe that's what the heart of the issue is. That there's people who, that he grew up with who are still in the same position that they're in now, who are still living in the same area, probably don't have such a good job, uh, just, you know, generally just not in a good place, who kind of look at, um, who look at Meek Mill and just see someone who's kind of taking a piss. <laughs> like how the fuck is he be able to like, you know, flash his jewel, be so flashy, be so like... Um, show be such a showboat right and they kind of set it within their head to kind of take him down and strip him of his wealth because they feel like maybe he doesn't deserve it and it's interesting as well because it shows just how just i don't know it just shows how poorly that stuff really goes down for the wider society i think maybe as hip-hop it kind of you know people see it as like a thing and it kind of works but i think for the wider society they look at that kind of thing and kind of you know it's a it does rub people up the wrong way you know the 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 obvious the obvious levels of opulence that people kind of display online especially because most part for the most part of it it's kind of exaggerated right it's not real for the most part some of it you know they don't have much money as you think they do have but obviously they're, they're very wealthy but i'd imagine that kind of contempt would brew in somebody that hasn't really actualized their own dreams and i guess it's probably a less it's probably like a cautionary tale for anyone out there about why how why it's so important for you to kind of achieve or to kind of go for your dreams because if you don't you end up being so bitter right and so angry at people that you actually want to tear them down in order for you to get up to get further in life which is not the way anyone wants to go about things i think in general you don't want to do that you don't want to be that person who's um tearing someone down in order for you to kind of like feel like you're doing something in life that's not the way to go about things but if you're this judge and you kind of feel as if like maybe Meek Mill isn't learning from his lessons and he's you see him doing something on a, on a moped somewhere. Maybe you want to, that's the way to kind of get back on it. But it kind of really, really took me back. I was like, Jesus Christ, man. Imagine that might be the whole reason why this judge has such a boner for Meek Mill for the most part. But hey, what can you do? But that was a great interview. I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, Meek Mill talks justice reform and opioid addiction on uh, Breakfast Club. Um, what else have I got here on my docket? Blah blah blah. Oh, Playboy Carter's new album, Die Lit, bombarded man. What a great bloody album, right? Amazing, 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 amazing album. I love the cover. I think he's done an amazing job with it. It's gotten amazing reviews everywhere. Um, I think Pitchfork rated it um, best new music. Um, that guy Anti Fantano, who I don't really listen to for the most part, says it's a really good album too. I think he gave it a seven out of ten. Um, it's a great album. It really goes to, I think it really goes to define or to really separate Playboy Carti from the rest of the pack. 
we can really see that he kind of is a flag a flag bearer a torch bearer for the new generation coming up for now i love the uh, I, I love the way he's pitched up his voice on the album um the first track the intro is amazing r.i.p is absolutely banger the track with skepta uh the track with Nicki minan young far gunner so many good tracks in there i highly recommend you check it out um and yeah, I'm a big fan of Playboy Carti, man. I think he's one of the, he's one of my favorite artists out there. He recently performed at uh, Lollapalooza, actually. I mean, sorry, at Rolling Loud. And that's the only issue I have with these um, new guys coming up now, right? He performed at Rolling Loud recently. Um, it was, and it was great, don't worry, because I love the album, but I'm so not a fan of rappers rapping over a vocal backing track, right? So basically what they do, they'll just play the MP3 and shout over it. And I absolutely detest it. I think it's so lazy. And you can't hear anything. And for the most part, it just involves rapper running up and jumping up and down. And for the most part, they just turn into a glorified hype man, right? For their own track. And it's really annoying because some of the tracks, especially Paper Car, some of, some of the lyrics are very simplistic. It's not as if he's like super, super rapping ways. You know, he's, he's repeating maybe the, the same syllables like four or five times. And he can't find the F, he can't be able to... He's not bothered enough to kind of like, you know, use an instrumental or, or at least you should use track with just the ad-libs in the background. But th this will kind of give you an idea of what the kind of performance was like. But it was on YouTube. I'll just play it quickly now. Playboy Carti at Rolling Loud, Miami. Such a good performance. I want to link it into, into the description if you're listening to this on the podcast so you can check it out yourself. But let me pause it for now. But yeah, absolutely love it. He's, he's got a great outfit on as well. A little Vetema, uh, Tommy Phil figure hoodie. Very, very nice. But for the most part, man, why would you play a backing track? You know, come on, man. Like, let me hear your voice, dude, man. Come on, let me hear your voice. I don't know what's wrong with these dudes, man. Like, you watch performances from like Woodstock. You see DMX playing. You remember that famous performance DMX playing at Woodstock? Is it Woodstock? Uh, DMX Live. <laughs> Let me see if I can get it up. It's an amazing performance where he's performing live, right? And he's actually using his voice. Like, none, none of this uh, backing track nonsense that all these other guys are doing. And it's an amazing performance. Not a lot of rappers do it. Um, Kanye West did it recently, too. I saw, I saw a video of Kanye West um, performing All Day Nigger at the Brit Awards. You remember that? With all the, fame, with all the flame fire throws going up. That was amazing, too. But let me check this out quickly. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I think it was. I think it was Woodstock. Was it Woodstock? DMX performing. It's like a crowd of people. You can't. You can't actually even make like he's like just absolutely smashing it, right? I think is it Woodstock, or is it? Um... Oh, it's Woodstock. Yeah, it's Woodstock. So this video, right, is insane. Absolutely insane, right? Look, watch. Check this out. And he's rapping for real. Rapping. No, no backing track, right? No backing track. so you guys can check it out right put it on full screen and he's actually actually performing performing right he's actually performing for real like no backing track at all no no backing track come on load oh this computer's so annoying your bluetooth gets delayed by a couple of seconds and you're flipping out right we're so spoiled aren't we so spoiled Again, I'm going to link all this stuff in, in the YouTube description so you guys can check it out as well. Uh, rest assured, I will. Actually, let me put this in my notes now so I don't forget. Put it here. DMX. Come on, son. I don't know why it's not loading. Maybe it's taking really long because I've got other things running in the background, but this is a really good performance. Um... He's performing it live, no backing track, just pure live. I don't know why a lot of artists don't do it. I my theory I mentioned to Brilliant the other day is like a lot of these hip hop artists when they when they make a track, they usually don't make the instrumental. They usually just make the make the beat in the studio, right? They might layer all of the effects and stuff, record the audio, and then the, that's the final copy, right? Let me let me go back. I got the interview wrong one. 
So I think they don't actually make an instrumental of it. They actually just that's the only copy. That's the only copy they make of it. So whenever you hear you see instruments on YouTube, it's usually someone reconstructing one, Re or remaking the beat themselves. But this is this is a this is DMX playing at Woodstock, right? What a great booking, right? Watch. Let's check this out. Let's fast forward a little bit and get him to play. There you go. He's got a great outfit on too. All red, red Timberlands, uh, Rough Riders shirt. I think a Rough Riders dungarees, like short dungarees. Looks amazing. Man, free, free DMX. I hope he gets healthy and comes back strong because he's an amazing live performer, man. DMX. Let me fast forward and see how play the other tracks. Like, why don't more people do this? He's actually he's actually rapping for real, like live vocals. But you know what? To be to be fair, the DJ is playing vinyl, right? And I remember from the, I've only got a few vinyl, I've only got a few hip hop vinyls, but I know for the most part, you always get the single, uh, the radio edit, a longer edit, maybe a dub edit. Some sort of house electronic edit and an instrumental. Always, I remember I used to get in a vinyl. That's what people used to always like buying uh, vinyl albums of hip hop art, especially singles. Right, so you'd get like, you might get a remix on there. You might get an extended version. You might get a radio edit. You might get like a a weird electronic edit with the, whoever the electronic big person is at the time. Maybe a Fat Boy Slim remix or something, and then a, and then an instrumental. So maybe that's why. But I think these rappers, man, it's so annoying. But I guess maybe if you're paying. If you're paying Metro Boomin a, a half a mil for a beat, right, you might not want to give everyone instrumental, right? And I remember 2 Chainz saying the same thing. He didn't really like when people uh, redid his songs. He didn't really like it. Um, these kind of new guys don't really like that for the most... Not new guys, but... Because 2 Chainz is one of the old, old generation. But maybe artistically, you want to do your song and just let that live. You don't want to have people remake it again. It's a bit annoying. But... For the for the listener, for me, the viewer going to see shows and stuff, I wanna see I wanna see a hip hop artist perform the song. Because the indie music, this never happens. Uh, Arctic Monkeys are never gonna just play their album on the CD and just play over it with their guitars. They're gonna play like a backing track, like maybe the bass or something, but for the most part they're playing the song live, right? With vocals. And then especially someone like uh, Mac DeMarco who I saw play at Primavera last year, he always improvises his song, so there's always he always adds a, like an extra bit on the chorus or stretches out the 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 bridge or extends the end a bit or makes mad crazy sounds. Like it's fucking insane. So it's always a uh, every performance is always a bit different. And for the most part, if you do, if you're just performing like this, this is a bit different too. The energy of the crowd, it's just, I know it's really difficult to do because I remember Michael, that's why I say Michael Jackson was one of the best performers of all time because he was dancing and singing his songs, you know, full pelt um, without any backing track um, back when he was around. So maybe it's a bit more difficult, but I wish these new generations would do it because someone like Playboy Carter, you know, these high energy tracks are mostly like, I don't know, two minutes, two minutes, four to three minutes, something, right? It'd be so cool to see Playboy Carter do that live. For the most part, but he don't, um, and a lot of them don't anyway. For the most part, but this video is amazing. I'll let me play a bit more of it, and I'll move on. Wow, man. Amazing. This is what hip-hop can be, man. Please, these new guys, perform live, man. No backing track, please. Look how good that is. So much fun. Ah! Anyway, let's see what else is on the docket. Um, so, yeah, let definitely check out Playboy Carter's new album. It's called Dial It. It's his debut album uh, after the 
famous and really well received uh, self titled Playboy Carti mixtape that first came out. And like I said, I, I think he separated himself from the pack. I really do think he's one of the best um, young kind of SoundCloud rapper, whatever you want to call them, is. Uh, he's done a really good job of him remaining really mysterious. He doesn't do much on social media, he doesn't really give many interviews. And he's actually talking about that uh, and being mysterious in interviews. I'm reading this book at the moment now about Mr. David Hammonds. This dude here, right? Right. This is an amazing book that I've been I've been reading for the last week or so. I've been had it on my um, I had it on my wish list for a while, and then obviously Mr. Kanye West decided to obviously put it up too. So a lot of people have also seen it too. But I've had this on I've had some before. I saw Kanye put it up. Um, it's on my wishes for a while, but I never got around to buying it, and then I finally bought it. And David Hammonds is like a very influential contemporary artist. You might have seen this image um, of him uh, selling these snowballs on the street. But there's a bit where he kind of speaks about, there's a bit where the author speaks about how he's purposely made himself hard to get in contact with. So that that basically, uh, the more the more hard to get in contact is with him personally, the bigger people read into his art. The more people read into his art and the more kind of infamous he becomes, right? And I think it's a very clever approach to artistry and creativity in general, especially nowadays where everyone's so in your face. And especially if you're a Playboy Carti, right? You've, you're in that scene where everyone's kind of got this face tats and the colourful dreads and they're always talking. So when you're the one person that does that, does the opposite, it's, you really stand out. He doesn't release any singles for the most part, right? He doesn't put any singles unless they're only on his own SoundCloud page. He, uh, loads of leaks from him leak from loads of leaks of his get out um, fans actually love sharing leaks and making unofficial mixtapes but he's only got one official mixtape and one official album but if you go online there's loads of other people that put together like sort of mixtapes for him but the passage here I want to read from this book uh, David Hammond's Blizzard Ball Cell uh, that kind of talks about the myth yeah so uh, the myth David Hammond says I would like to be a myth uh, be on the invisible side of things the shadow when you're always seen, people get used to that and you aren't a mystery anymore. I've seen it happen many times. And I think it's a very interesting way to go back. I remember I mentioned somebody in, in at, at work about this. I said, if you are a rapper now, right, the best way to probably come out would be to be, the best way to kind of present yourself to the public would be to shave your head, right? Ha have a one level or a fade or something, a really, a really like simple haircut, not like this sort of haircut, right? A really like simple haircut, no dreads or anything. Um, probably no facial hair either. Wear a white shirt, blue jeans, and white trainers. Just be completely, just really plain as fuck. But don't do any interviews and uh, no interviews, no op no nothing. Maybe a few editorials here and there, but nothing of you speaking. And only release mu quality music in packages, like m not even in singles. Like always put out projects, like whether it's a mixtape or an album. And I think you'd, you, your, your notoriety would absolutely skyrocket, especially nowadays where everyone's so dependent on communication even for me for instance like i'm on all social media platforms i'm always putting out things on different sort of avenues i've got a dj i put out podcasts i do vlogs on here sometimes uh i tweet i blog i'm on instagram i take pictures you know what i mean i do loads of all those kind of avenues but imagine you just kind of cut it all off you didn't do any outside interviews you didn't answer to any in any interviews any questions any appearances nothing you just did shows and you put out music that's it and you look completely normal like quote unquote normal right i think that's an amazing way to go about things so i think um this book if you're an artist and you want to really get a uh, get away from what everyone else is doing at the moment look look how cool david hammonds is like come on man that's fucking cool as fuck i definitely recommend you check out this book david hammonds blizzard ball sale by elena filipovic um yeah amazing it's uh, amazing insight there about remaining a myth and a mystery and playboy car has done a really really good job of doing that at the moment so um, what else was on the docket? What else was on the docket? What else was on the docket here to speak about? Sam Ida site, Cardi B V. Nah, Cardi B stuff not really that interesting anymore. Uh, nah, 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 nah. I think that might be it, you know. Maybe that might maybe that's a good way to end it, actually. And then I can do the next part of the docket stuff later on in the week. I think that might be a good way to kind of end stuff. So, as always, thank you so much again for tuning into the Agus News English Show. This has been episode what, number seventy eight. Um, it's been a good time. I've enjoyed speaking to you as per usual. I'm really happy to show to have shown you my new Wave Runner 700s. Ah, I'm so happy I've got them. So happy, so happy, so happy. Um, 
as always, uh, please check out all things uh, regarding me and my endeavors on agostino.com. It has all my DJ mixes, my event listings, my podcast, uh, social media links, all that malarkey. If you watch this on YouTube, please like, uh, share and subscribe and tell all your friends about the stuff that I'm doing now, especially if you're interested in it. And if you're looking for books to read, obviously visit my uh, Audible link. You can find that below too at audible.com forward slash A-double-G-G-Y. You can get a 30-day free trial and one free book credit to read as many books as you want during that month. You know, you can obviously top up with your own money too, but just read one book, see if you like it, and you can cancel it any, any, any time. Anyway, this has been the Exynos English Show episode number 72. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm out. <laughs>